The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to the 79th Modcast. This episode of the Modcast is kindly sponsored by Thorncliffe, experts in the politics of planning and community engagement. Find out more at thorncliffe.com. I'm Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, in conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, good afternoon. And this is, of course, the first time we've spoken um, with you as a backbencher for some time. Yes, absolutely. So I am therefore uh, able to go back to speaking somewhat more freely than I could when I was bound by collective responsibility. That's great. And what we're going to do uh, in the next few episodes of the Modcast is look back um, a little at what's been happening in politics recently, rather than me trying to put you on the spot insofar as I ever could about whatever the controversy of the day is that will be forgotten by tomorrow anyway. So I thought we'd have a conversation about the Liz Truss leadership campaign and the Liz Truss premiership. And I'd like to start it in this way, thinking back to the summer and thinking back to it really in the context of the economy, because the whole Truss premiership rose and fell on the basis of her plans for the economy. And in the summer, I was asked by the Daily Telegraph to write about the two candidates and Margaret Thatcher. So I went and had a look at the early Thatcher budgets and in some taxes went up and in some taxes went down. And you could make arguments about um, what had been done on the tax front. One thing that struck me very much was that in both the 79 budget and the 89 budget, very different sorts of budget, The planned increase in public spending was scaled back. And Margaret was always very cautious about increasing public spending. And I wondered at the time why neither of the candidates were willing to front up to party members about the fact that public spending clearly had to be reined in. Though Liz Trussley went into her premiership on the back of a leadership campaign where my memory is she'd not said she had to deal with public spending at all. And so it was obvious from the first, even to me as a non-economist, there was a big problem here. Do you agree there was a problem? And if if you do, why do you think it happened? It's a very interesting point, because in my previous role as government efficiency minister, I was actually leading the charge in a way for getting public expenditure under control, admittedly in the relatively small way of dealing with the civil service budget. And that was something that Boris Johnson had specifically asked me to do. And I agree with you that it was fairly obvious, it's still fairly obvious that public expenditure is too high. The reason we've got the highest tax burden in 70 years is because we've got the highest public expenditure. Uh, And uh, we've got to work out whether we're spending money in the right areas. And there are some very difficult bits to cut, like the health service and welfare um, benefits. But are we confident that all government expenditure is as it should be. Are we confident that we are using taxpayers' money efficiently? And I rather agree with your Thatcher analysis that we need to be running the slide rule over all government expenditure. And it was a key missing part from both candidates' uh, platforms. Why? Um, I think you need to rewind quite a bit. I, I think that there has been too optimistic in a view of the economy generally. Very few people have got it right. I point to two people. One is um, Andy Haldane, who forecast inflation, and the other is Kit Malthouse, who was doing so from within government. And they were sounding the alarm bell, and everyone else was saying, everything's fine, everything's rosy, don't worry. And that that was a mistake. I very much agreed with what Kit was saying. I thought that the government needed to start warning people that difficult economic times were coming, but that wasn't what people want to do in a leadership campaign, for obvious reasons. You don't think party members would have faced up to it if if either of the candidates had said, look, it's very important to cut tax, but tax cuts have got to march in step with reductions in the rate of growth of public spending? Well, 
I, I think there are a number of things that should be done in tax, tax cuts. One is that we should look at removing exemptions so that you can cut rates whilst um, not having great effect on revenue because we have a very complex tax system. That was one of the things that Quasi was working towards was a simplified uh, tax system. I think, as it happens, that the nation at large was ready for this type of conversation. And uh, um, the government, Boris Johnson's go the government led by Boris Johnson, ought to have been intimating this from about a year ago. Uh, and that it didn't because there is perhaps a reluctance to give bad news. I happen to think that the electorate is more intelligent than it's given credit for. And that the electorate, if it is faced with an uncomfortable truth, will respond to it. Um, but then I'm not a PR guru. We'll talk about Boris Johnson's premiership, I think, in another episode. So let's not quite go there now. But in essence, you're really saying that Liz Truss was wary of stating the obvious for political reasons in case she was attacked by Rishi Sunak during the leadership election and perhaps vice versa. I, I think that's right. I think both sides were very cautious about pointing out um, that it had already become quite clear that we were facing difficult economic times, that if you look at the interest rate increases that the Federal Reserve has applied, from the level of interest rate that we've started with, these are quite extraordinary. They are equivalent to what Volcker was doing, uh, if not more so, in the early 1980s in terms of proportionality. The, the actual percentage, 25 basis points here and there, 50 basis points, 75 basis points, um, is lower, but the proportion of, from where we were starting is considerably higher. And just to tidy one point up, you mentioned Kit Malthouse. There's been so much change, chopping and changing of roles recently that our listeners will have found it quite hard to keep up. Was this when Kit was in the Cabinet Office? Yes. It was when he was in the Cabinet. It was as a Cabinet Minister, Kit was warning other Cabinet Ministers that the economic situation was more difficult than they were uh, thinking. He was warning, but the Treasury wasn't? No, no, he, he was um, doing a very good role as Cassandra. OK, um, let's go forward to the trust government and just uh, so much has happened so quickly that, as I say, um, we're on danger of forgetting. Just talk for a minute about your role within the trust government. What was my role? Well, I was Business Energy Industrial Strategy Secretary. Um, the key thing I had to do was work on the energy plan, the support for individuals and for businesses or non-domestic users more accurately. And that I started doing actually before I was appointed because it was very urgent. The announcement of the um, energy support package was dependent on the date the suppliers send out their direct debits to their customers. So that's why it happened on the 8th of September, which then obviously was the day the Queen died. Uh, but that was why it had to be done as soon as the government came in. There was great pressure to act quickly. And we came up with a scheme that was very generous, very expensive, though the cost has come down very significantly because of the gas price declining. And that, I think, was right. I, I, I actually liked the scheme Keith Anderson came up with from Scottish Power, where people would pay back over the longer term and that it would be um, more of a government guarantee than a, a government bailout. But that didn't win the argument, and the uh, simple scheme did. It needed to be all-encompassing because the extent of the increase that we were talking about in September was one that people on good incomes could not have afforded. And therefore, you were going to be hitting people a long way up the income scale who wouldn't normally come into contact with the benefits office. And you also needed to help a lot of businesses because if your energy bill goes up six, seven, or eightfold, there are very few businesses that use so little energy that that doesn't have a big effect on their bottom line. I want to say at this point, um, quite openly, while people are confessing what they did and mistakes they may have made um, and things they may have got right, that on Con Home, um, we completely backed up the package at a time when um, lots of think tanks were saying it was, it was too expensive 
and you should target support more carefully and this wasn't a good use of, of taxpayers' money. I think the reason for that was it seemed the simplest thing for government to do, to just cut through the Gordian knot and pay the money without getting into details of affordability, because it might be that there's someone uh, on a modest income in a very large house and someone on a modest income in a very small one. How did you make the arrangements for all that? So I, I think the government at a point, the question I, I would ask would be in retrospect, was it right to say that this should continue for two years, which Jeremy Hunt's now scaled back? I'll give you an example of what influenced me in why you didn't set a cap on the energy usage. And that was thinking of some of the social housing in North East Somerset, where it's some of it is around the war, either just pre or just post war, is not to a high standard of insulation. Uh, and you may have a larger former council house with people living in it that isn't well insulated. And they would have been in terrible difficulties if we'd said, after a certain amount, you pay the full whack. So I, I think you're right, Conservative Home was right, we were right to do it all encompassingly. Um, two years, the, the reason for doing two years was to provide people with reassurance. And partly as a recognition of reality that if gas prices next winter are up at um, the 350 um, uh, um, pound level from the 50 pound level that they had been at before, um, the government will come up with another scheme for next year. And if it's very extreme, the government will come up with a scheme that helps almost everybody. And therefore, in a way, whether you're off it for one year or two years is entirely dependent on market forces. If the market corrects, the scheme doesn't cost anything in the second year. If the market doesn't correct, you end up doing it anyway, is my assumption. Um, this was the same with uh, businesses. We limited businesses to six months, but then people were saying to me, what are you going to do with a hospice next winter? To which the obvious answer was, well, if gas prices are as high as they are in early um, September, we will be ho helping hospices next year. And what about nursing homes? We'll be helping nursing homes. What about pubs? We'll be helping pubs. What about the steel industry? We'll be helping the steel industry. And, and so, in a way, the timelines are an, a, a hope, an aspiration, rather than, to my mind, anything set in stone. It will depend on the price. And actually, much anything thanks to the Germans cut in their usage, prices have come down, extra supply has come on, everybody's tried to squeeze their supply as much as possible. So the price is well down on off its peaks. Um, and assuming it remains at these lower levels, then the whole cost of the scheme becomes lower anyway. And things like uh, issuing more licenses for the North Sea will help at the margins. Do you think Jeremy Hunt's right, in fact, to cut the support for a year? Well, as I say, I think if there's still a major problem, it will be extended anyway. So I, I, I think it's fine but it may give him a slightly easier ride with the ABR. And just on the point about the extraordinary extensiveness of this scheme, um, already only a few days have passed, literally I can't really say weeks since the Trust Premiership end, a battle is being fought over what happened. And one school of thought says what went wrong is all to do with the mini-budget, to which we'll come in a moment. But there's another school of thought that says... What is all this about a radical free market institute of economic affairs government? It's clear what went wrong with the trust government. The trust government spent too much money rather than too little. It's pouring all this money into energy support on top of all the support poured in for COVID. And what went wrong with the trust government is it's too statist, not that it was too libertarian. What do you think of that? I think you come to the fundamental point of what is the state there for? And I think the state is there to help when people can't do it for themselves. And the cost of energy has to be paid for by the economy one way or another. And which way do you want it to be paid for? Do you want it to be paid for centrally so that everybody can afford to keep their business running? Or do you want to close 70% of public houses? 
which is what we're being threatened with. And do you want to find that most people can't afford to heat their homes during the winter? There are expenditures that the state has to take on, whether you're a free marketeer or you're a socialist, that hit at certain times. And I think the COVID bills and the energy bills were in that category. Um, if the COVID costs hadn't been taken on, we wouldn't have had any economy to recover with. You know, practically every business would have gone out if it hadn't had any income during the government imposed close down. Now, energy prices are also, to some extent, government created. Partly we have had um, a very wishful thinking approach to energy policy in this country, which left us highly exposed to movements in the gas price. And therefore, there is an element that the government had created this problem for people. If we had followed different energy policy, if we'd got on with nuclear power, for example, then we would have had greater security of supply, less necessity for an increase in price. If we hadn't set up systems that based renewable energy on the gas price, we wouldn't have had quite the spike in electricity prices that we were getting. So I slightly feel that if the government creates the problem, the government has to solve the problem. And a lot of the failures in energy policy were government created. I suppose another way of looking at it is the government created the problem and the taxpayer then solves the problem. Um, there, 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 there's, there's truth in that. I mean, but this is one of the things that worried me about our energy policy. I'm particularly concerned about our steel industry. Our steel industry pays, in normal times, 60% more on its energy bills than steel industry on the continent. This is because we put extra charges on top. And we then say to them, uh, they get um, some free allowance for their carbon emissions. But if they don't produce steel, even though they're losing money because the costs are so high, they will lose their free allowance under the emissions trading scheme. It's like airlines losing their slots at Heathrow if they don't fly ghost planes. So what we are doing is making our steel industry uneconomic so that we import steel from abroad, which is cheaper, but it's only cheaper because of the impositions we put on our domestic industry, which creates more carbon emissions than if we allowed our own steel industry to be competitive. So the background to the increase in energy prices is not just Putin's war in Ukraine, it is also bad energy policy making domestically in the UK. The general argument you're putting forward is that in certain circumstances, government has to step in, then almost in brackets, even when actually part of the reason for stepping in is the government's fault. Yes. And that, that's fine. Um, I'm just saying, that obviously, it's not fine, but it's fine in the context of establishing your view about the trust energy bailout. So now let's get on to the mini budget. So did you have any role at all uh, in the consultations running up to the mini budget? Um, I was involved in some early discussions over the summer, beginning of August, but I didn't know the um, details of the budget. Those were kept very tight. And your understanding is that um, essentially the, the the mini budget, as I'll call it, was arranged between the then Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss, then the Prime Minister and a few aides. That's how I understand it. And what is it exactly that, that happened? Because in your understanding, in the weeks before the mini budget happened, I um, had a conversation with someone who later had a very senior role in the Trust administration and said, you realise in your statement you're going to have to deal with public spending, aren't you? Going back to where we were at the start of this conversation. Mm. And on, on the day, um, William Atkinson from Conservative Home was writing about it and I rang him up and said, in the statement, what did the Chancellor say about public spending? And William said, nothing very much. I said, are you sure? Could you go back and, and have a look? The, the sum is that, first of all, Tom Scholar, the permanent secretary, was moved. Then a statement was made with no cover from the OBR. Um, tax cuts were announced that were, were not expected. Nothing was said about public spending, really. And then over the weekend, when the Chancellor was asked about tax cuts, he rather breezily indicated there might be some more. And um, the markets, which had been a bit jittery anyway, just sort of took fright. 
So why did all this happen? Because um, even to a, you know, an amateur like me, it's obvious that if you weren't shoring yourself up on the spending side and taking some other elementary precautions, it was likely to go horribly wrong. I mean, look, I think it needed a three-pronged approach. It needed the tax reform, it needed public expenditure control, and it needed the supply-side reforms as the three legs of the stool. And one leg of the stool was announced, and the other two weren't. Um, you're right about the markets already taking fright. I, I happen to think the biggest reason for the um, fall in the pound and the run on gilts was the Bank of England's decision not to put up interest rates the day before, or to put them up by 50 basis points rather than match the Fed. I thought that was a significant error, compounded by the um, LDIs, which the Bank of England apparently has in its own pension fund. And were an, I mean, I, I, I was, I didn't know about the LDIs, but I was so appalled that we had got a regulatory system where our regulator told underfunded pension funds that they ought to hold gilts, which they were saying the whole time that was the mantra from the pension fund regulator, and then allowed them to gear up at a high-risk, low-probability um, instrument with a high-risk, high low-probability instrument um, when interest rates were at their low in the whole of history. Well, if interest rates are their low in the whole of history, they can only go one way. And therefore, you were taking an enormous risk that at some point interest rates would normalise, crystallising a loss in these LDIs. I mean, it is that the mini-budget certainly didn't help. And the fact that it didn't have the other two legs of the stool didn't help. But the institutional failing of the Bank of England, pension fund regulator, um, uh, the PRA, was, I think, quite extraordinary. I think, I may be wrong here, be corrected by listeners, that it's Warren Buffett who said it's not until the tide goes out that you see who's swimming naked. And a question that's puzzled me about the pension fund arrangements is um, rather like the question the Queen's meant to have asked in the aftermath of the financial crash. So I think the Queen's question was, why did no one see this coming in advance, or words to that effect? Yeah. Are you aware of anyone having written about this structural no. problem in, in, uh, in, in pension funds before the crisis actually no, happened? No, I, I had no idea these things existed. And they reminded me of LTCM, which um, was a similar clever way of getting a very marginal return from very large amounts of money. So your at-risk amount of money is huge, your return on it is relatively small, um, and you, uh, you, you, you find that you create a mismatch of assets and liabilities, and of duration particularly. And this was just extraordinary folly. And, but then it was ridiculous. I, I, was the, I was trustee of a pension fund for some years, a conservative agents pension fund, and we were constantly being told that we should hold more guilt, that guilt was the safe thing to own. And this was ridiculous because there was no return on guilt. There's no way you could make the money you needed for the pensioners if you just held guilt. That's what the regulator wanted. So uh, I think we really need to examine our system of regulation because it hasn't worked. And uh, to, to accept an area where I um, was certainly at fault, um, I didn't think the ABR mattered a row of beans didn't realise the city paid such attention to its forecasts, because they've always been wrong. Um, uh, and um, I, mean, I happen to think Robert Choate was an absolutely excellent leader of the ABR, and I thought he did it with great distinction. But even Robert's forecasts were wrong, and they've been even worse since, since he's gone. Um, the city minded. One thing I was right about is I said, we mustn't do anything to undermine the independence of the Bank of England. I think the government has to stick to that. I think independence is a theoretically good thing. Unfortunately, the Bank of England has done a bad job. And just because you believe in independence does not mean you shouldn't hold the Bank of England to account. Was it at all damaging that um, Liz Truss during the summer campaign had suggested some form of reform of the bank? Um, 
which if the uh, government uh, and the bank are not on the same page, you, you get into difficulty, as you'll remember uh, from the Conservative Conference of 2016, I think, where Theresa May, primed presumably by Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill in her speech, said something about the bank, um, bank's inadequacies. And the next day, there was all sorts of turmoil in the uh, market. I, I mean, I, I think the government has to be very careful what it says about the Bank of England. Um, I am now able to take the view that the bank must be held to account because independence is one thing, lack of accountability another. OK. Well, we've established that um, you, do, you think some of the blame lies with the mini-budget, some with the bank and, uh, and the system of regulation. It's just a little last question, perhaps, on, on that. Perhaps it's impossible to answer. Why on earth do you think Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng did it? Uh, look, I think there was a feeling that um, there was great urgency to act, that there was great tendency to delay things and then they never happened. And um, uh, therefore, if it were done when it is done for well, it were done quickly. And do you think there was a little bit of a view within the Trust administration? I felt this myself that they they somehow felt all their recent successor Conservative or coalition predecessors had somehow been sort of too timorous and too conventional and too interventionist, and that they were jolly well going to show them how it should all be done, even if they only had two years to do it. I think there was a feeling that um, there was an opportunity to get things done in two years and that two years was a short time and you had to try and bed in what you wanted to do. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly thought it was important to act quickly and in the bit I was directly responsible for, the energy um, support, that had to be done quickly for a technical reason, a bit like the railway timetables in the First World War. I mean, the, the direct debits going out had to be done before they, they went out. Um, but I, I think it was both acting urgently and not urgently enough. Therefore, we needed the supply side reforms and uh, the spending cuts at the same point. Jacob, thank you very much. That's been fascinating. We've gone from the leadership campaign of the summer through to the mini budget. And I think next time we will follow events, go back over events from the mini budget to the end of the uh, trust government. So um, thank you very much. And this episode of the podcast has been brought to you by Conservative Home in partnership with Thorncliffe. Well, thank you very much. It's a very interesting early retrospective. The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.